Hello, friends. This is lecture six of a series where we go through the book on quantum mechanics by Steven Weinberg. This is part six and the final part of chapter three on the general principles of quantum mechanics. After this chapter, we shall build on this foundation and go through many interesting examples to bring to life the formalism we have developed, and more importantly, to learn new techniques to calculate with this theory. So that we can make connections with actual physical effects observed in the lab, as explained in the first lecture, we will be reading the book in the sequence chapter three, then two, followed by one, and continue from there according to the regular order of the book. In the last lecture, we ended our discussion on the theory of symmetries in quantum mechanics. In this lecture. We shall begin by elaborating on the connection between time reversal and anti-unitary operators, which is briefly mentioned in Lecture Three. This will provide one last example of symmetry transformations in this chapter. Finally, we will touch on the topics of the interpretations of quantum mechanics and also explain the infamous measurement problem, which presence is recognized right from the beginning of this theory. And which might indicate its limitations. Let's get started. We now explain the connection between symmetries represented by anti-unitary operators and time reversal. Recall that we have alluded to this in an earlier discussion about symmetry operators in Lecture Three, and listed the unitary and anti-unitary operators as the two possible ways in which symmetries are implemented. This is stated in Wigner's theorem on quantum symmetries. Here, we will prove that an anti-unitary symmetry always leads to time reversal as one of the consequences. Recall the definition of an anti-unitary operator. It is an operator that does not change the inner product of any two vectors apart from a complex conjugation. Compare this with an unitary operator. For both of these operators, their inverse are the same as their Hermitian conjugation. As we have shown in lecture three, this inner product property of U bar implies that it must also be an anti-linear operator. The anti-linear property is almost identical with the linear property, except that an additional complex conjugation must again be applied to the coefficients of the superposition. We now proceed to prove that an anti-unitary symmetry must lead to time reversal. Let U bar be an anti-unitary operator which represents a symmetry transformation. It would be convenient to view this transformation in a Schrödinger's picture, such that U bar converts any state psi in the reference frame of observer O to a state U bar psi in the frame of O prime, whereas physical observables remain unchanged and are represented by the same operators for both. As the system evolves from time equals zero to time t. The state according to observer O turns from psi to the time evolved psi generated by the Hamiltonian, as prescribed by quantum mechanics. Looking at this from the viewpoint of O prime, if the same time evolution operator applies also in this reference frame, then we are led to the final state in the yellow box. For the moment, let's put a question mark to this time evolution rule in the transformed frame. Later, it will be found that this actually leads to contradictory results. To be consistent, this final state has to agree with the one obtained by applying U bar to the final state described by O, which converts it to a description by O prime. The equality of the yellow box and the red box for any arbitrary state psi. Leads to the operator equation in the white box. Let's rearrange this equation by using the identity in the green box.
This same identity allows us to bring in U-bar dagger U-bar to enclose H. This move is very similar to the case of a unitary operator, apart from one key distinction. There is a change of sign for the imaginary I. This is because U-bar is anti-linear. So is U-bar dagger. This means that when U-bar dagger moves past minus I, we must take a complex conjugation, turning it into I. From the equation at the top, comparing the exponent on both sides, we can conclude that h under an anti-unitary transformation becomes minus h. We claim that this will lead to a contradiction. This can be seen in the following way. For any Hamiltonian, its eigenvalues must be bounded from below by some minimum value. This is so that the system would not cascade in the lower and lower energy states, releasing an infinite amount of energy in the process. For observer O, if there is an energy state with a positive eigenvalue, what is the eigenvalue of its counterpart U bar E in the frame of O prime? Apply H to this, and using the identity in the blue box, we have. Notice that the term in the green box is just the left-hand side of the equation in the yellow box. And so is equal to minus H. We can now apply H directly to state E, and use the eigenvalue equation above. Thus the eigenvalue of u bar e is equal to minus e, which is negative. Since there is no upper bound to e, minus e could be arbitrarily small, even smaller than the minimum energy e naught. Thus the state u bar e is an eigenstate of h with an energy lower than its minimum energy. This is an obvious contradiction. Therefore, the equation in the yellow box, which leads to this conclusion, must be inconsistent. This problem could be easily fixed if we assume instead that the action of u bar leaves h invariant, thereby allowing us to drop the resulting minus sign in front of e. As a result, the state E and U bar E would have the same energy, which is greater than E naught, thus removing the contradiction. So we should use the consistent relation in the yellow box instead. Tracing the source of the inconsistency in the red box. leads us back to the assumption of the time evolution rule in the frame of O prime. We have assumed that it would be the same for O prime as for O, which is the time evolution operator in the blue box. However, this leads to the contradiction. Let's do the same for the consistent equation in the green box and see what sort of time evolution in the O' prime frame leads to this result. It seems that all it takes to make things right is to change the sign in the time evolution operator for O'. prime. We can look again at the overall situation to be clear about how the equation in the white box which leads to the correct solution comes about. Let the state u bar psi in the frame of O prime evolves according to the new time evolution rule. This leads to the state at time t in the yellow box. Now convert the corresponding state at the same time from the frame of O to O prime. This should agree with the previous state to be consistent. Because psi is arbitrary, this implies the equation in the white box, which we have just shown, 
gives results consistent with the energy spectrum. This confirms that we have the correct time evolution rule in the frame of O prime. To agree with the time evolution rule in the formalism of quantum mechanics, this has to be written in the following standard form, where time for observer O prime has to be redefined as T prime, which is equal to minus T. T is the time of observer O. This means the time reversal of O prime relative to O. Thus, the requirement of a lower bound on energy, together with the time evolution rule in quantum mechanics, demand that any anti-unitary symmetry must be accompanied by time reversal. This is a general result. Let's introduce one more bit of operator maths. This is an operation that acts on an operator and turns it into a number. The trace of an operator A is defined as the following. It is the sum of diagonal elements of the matrix representation of A given in an arbitrary basis. The fact that the basis can be arbitrary but yet gives the same value for trace will be proven in a minute. Let's look at some properties of the trace. The most obvious feature is that it is linear in its action on operators. This can be seen from the right-hand side of the definition in the blue box. The linearity is the feature of the brackets of operators. Alpha and beta are complex numbers. We now introduce an alternative definition of the trace. The trace of a cat bra operator is given by, which is just the inner product of the bra and cat, that is, the trace of a cat bra is the bracket. This definition is explicitly basis independent, and we shall show that it is equivalent to the blue box. Let's insert the identity operator, which is also basis independent. We can reorder the two terms in the yellow box. It is then apparent that we end up with a result that is equivalent to the right hand side of the blue box. If A is set to the cat bra psi phi. Therefore, the definition of trace in the blue box is also basis independent, since it is equivalent to the one in the yellow box. Let's quickly remind ourselves why any operator can be expressed as cat bras. Let's take the trace of this using the yellow box and show that the result agrees with the blue box. The trace of a cat bra also makes another feature of the trace more apparent. It is cyclic in its argument. The trace of the product of operators A and B is equal for both orders. This can be seen by letting A be cat bra 1 and B be cat bra 2. The trace in one order is given by. Note that the entire term in the yellow braces can be treated as one cat. This can be evaluated using the definition in the yellow box. What we just did is closing the first cat with the last bra of the product.
the product of these two complex numbers can simply be switched. As a result, the right-hand side of this equation can then be written as another trace. Hence the trace of an operator product is the same in both orders. This proves the cyclic property. The last property which we will look at is how the trace of a Hermitian conjugate is related to the original operator. Recall that the Hermitian conjugate of a cat bra is simply switching the bra and cat. This relation about cat bras immediately generalizes to any operators. Thus the trace of a Hermitian conjugate is just a complex conjugate of the trace. Up till now, the states we have been looking at are what is known as pure states. These are vectors in Hilbert space. We now introduce another kind of state called the mixed state. This is the situation where the system is in some state among an ensemble of states. We just don't know exactly which one, only their probabilities. These probabilities therefore sum to 1. This is what is known as a classical mixture of quantum states, classical in the sense that the system is definitely already in one of these states, we are just uncertain about which, and there are only quantum uncertainties within each state vector. We emphasize that the states within this ensemble need not be orthogonal to each other and can be quite arbitrary. So the information contained in a mixed state are the states in the ensemble and their probabilities of occurrence. One example of how such a state is prepared is when someone rolled the dice and handed us a state from the ensemble, depending on this result, while we on the other hand are blind to this selection. The mixed state carries all the statistical information about the system. For example, we can calculate the average value of an observable. For just a single state in the ensemble, this is given by. This is the average over one quantum state, while the average over the entire ensemble is simply the expectation value over all the states weighted with the given probabilities. Each bracket of A within the sum can be expressed as the trace of the product of A and a projector of each state in the ensemble. Here we have used the rule for the trace of a cat bra by regarding A acting on psi i as another cat. Using the linearity of the trace, we can bring in the entire sum. We define this weighted sum over all the projectors of states in the ensemble as the operator rho. This is what is known as a density operator. This operator allows us to calculate the average value of any observable of the system, which is in a mixed state, using the equation in the green box. Since rho carries all the statistical information of a mixed state, from here on, we shall regard them as identical. As further evidence of this last point, we now show how the density operator can be used to calculate the probability of an outcome from measuring an observable. Suppose A is the observable we are measuring with its complete set of outcomes given by the state's alphas. 
For a given state psi i in the ensemble, we wish to know the probability of getting the outcome alpha j from this measurement. This is the conditional probability of getting alpha j given that the system is prepared in state psi i, which is just the absolute square of the inner product between the two vectors. This can be written as a trace. Note that we could also view this projector of psi i as a density operator of a pure state. This simple probability relation will generalize to the density operator of a mixed state, as we shall see. To calculate the probability of getting this same outcome, but from over the entire ensemble, we need to sum these conditional probabilities over all the states weighted by their probability of occurrence. The expression in the blue box is just the probability of getting alpha j given the mixed state rho. Once again, we can use the linearity of the trace on the right hand side of this equation. Due to the cyclic property, we can switch the order. This is the same result as for the pure state. This equation allows us to calculate the probability distribution of any measurement on a mixed state. One great advantage of using the density operator to describe a quantum state is that unphysical overall phases are automatically excluded. This is easily seen by looking at the pure state psi, which is equivalent to the same vector multiplied by an arbitrary phase. To get the density operator, simply multiply this by the corresponding bra, and the phase just cancels itself. This feature is of course common to any projectors of states, and also holds for any density operator. The density operator is a mission because the probabilities of the mixture are real, and the associated projectors are also Hermitian. This means rho can be expressed in terms of its eigenbasis, with eigenvalues denoted by lowercase pj to the eigenvectors vj. This is an orthonormal basis. There are d numbers of basis elements corresponding to the dimensionality of the Hilbert space, which contains rho. While the number of states in the mixture, denoted by n, can be arbitrary, since they are not an orthonormal set. Therefore, the probabilities of the mixture are not equal to the eigenvalues of rho in general. The trace of a density operator, given that the states in the mixture are all normalized, is equal to 1. Since the probabilities sum to 1, therefore rho is also normalized. We can also evaluate this trace using the eigenbasis of rho in the blue box. This, of course, must be equal to 1 which means the eigenvalues pj's must also sum to 1. Another important property of rho is that it is a positive operator. This means all its eigenvalues must be non-negative. This, together with the fact that they must sum to 1, suggests that we can interpret them as probabilities. The way we show this positivity is by evaluating the bracket of rho with respect to an arbitrary state phi. Using the expression in the yellow box, we have This is now just a sum of positive numbers, and therefore must be non-negative. Since the vector phi is arbitrary, we can set it to any eigenvector of rho, and this inequality must still hold. The bracket of rho with respect to its eigenvector vj is just the eigenvalue. 
Thus, we have shown the positivity of operator rho. This also verifies our earlier claim that the eigenvalues of rho can be seen as probabilities, which means the eigenbasis expansion of the mixed state can be regarded as an alternative mixture with the same density operator rho. Thus, rho can correspond to at least two mixture, one according to the way the state is actually prepared, and another in terms of its eigenstates. We simply can't tell the difference by only making measurements on rho. Only the person who prepared the state knows the exact mixture. In fact, there are an infinite number of mixtures that correspond to the same density operator. This is a rather remarkable fact about mixed states. This flexibility in representations is used in many proofs of theorems concerning density operators. We shall give a straightforward demonstration right away. We start with the original mixture of rho. Basically, we will show that any arbitrary unitary transformation will give us a different mixture for the same density operator. And since there are an infinite number of unitary matrices, we will have an infinite number of different mixtures. To make things simple, let's cast this into the following form. Where we have absorbed the probabilities into the cat broth. This can be written as a double sum by introducing the Kronecker delta, which is just the identity matrix and can be written as the product of any unitary matrix with its Hermitian conjugate. Pay close attention to which indices are free and which are summed over. The sum is over values from 1 to n, matching the domain of i and i prime, because u must be a square matrix. Let's put this back into the equation. We define the state resulting from the sum over i as tilde phi j, while the state associated with the sum over i prime is just the Hermitian conjugate of this. The trace of this expression is still equal to 1. Since each term in this sum is an absolute square of a vector, which by definition is non-negative, this equation implies that the absolute square of tilde phi j is a fraction. We denote this fraction as qj. This means tilde phi j can be written as a normalized state which is just phi j multiplied by the square root of qj. Using the yellow box, we can relate the state tilde phi j back to the original ensemble states psi i. Now using the green box, we have expressed phi j in terms of psi j in the blue box. In fact, let's express all the unnormalized tilde states in terms of the normalized non-tilde states. Note that the expression in the green box, which is the alternate form of the density operator, is also in the standard form of a mixed state, with qj's as the probabilities associated with the normalized projectors phi j. Since there are an infinite number of unitary matrices to construct the states phi j out of psi i, using the relation in the blue box, the number of the resulting alternate mixed states in the green box is also infinite. Thus, we have shown how a density operator can have an infinite number of representations as mixed states. The density operator could represent both a pure state and a mixed state. It is a pure state if there is only one state in its ensemble. It would be good to have a quantity that could distinguish between a pure state and a mixed state. For this purpose, the von Neumann entropy is introduced. 
this was invented by the famous Hungarian mathematician John von Neumann, who also established much of the mathematical foundation of quantum mechanics. In fact, his book on this subject is still in print and widely read. To better understand this formula, let's look at the operator within the trace and cast it into a convenient form using the expression of rho in its eigenbasis. Rho can just be replaced by its eigenvalues since it is acting on its eigenstates. This new expression is precisely the Gibbs entropy in statistical mechanics, where it is introduced to quantify the uncertainties in the probability distributions describing classical ensembles in a many-particle system. But there is a great distinction from the quantum mechanical case. The probabilities pj only describe measurements in the eigenbasis of rho. In quantum mechanics, one can make measurements in many different bases that correspond to observables that do not commute with each other. Hence, we will get different probability distributions depending on what we are measuring. In classical mechanics, all the physical attributes of a system can occur simultaneously, and there could be one joint probability distribution for all of them. Nevertheless, we shall show that the von Neumann entropy can provide a meaningful measure of disorder within Rho. To do this, we must first determine a good criteria for a disordered state. Suppose initially we were given a mixed state rho. We then perform a measurement to see if our system could be in a particular state psi. The probability of such an outcome is given by. It makes sense to say that rho is a state of maximum disorder if the probability of finding any state within it are the same. This means the bracket of rho with respect to any state must be constant. The equation in the blue box implies that rho must be proportional to the identity operator. The normalization condition then fix the prefactor to be 1 over d. Thus, the state in the yellow box is a reasonable maximum disorder state. Let's see what is the value of its entropy. Substituting the expression in the yellow box. In the second equality, we have used the identity in the blue box. Note that the term in brackets is a C number. The trace of the identity operator is just d. Thus we have the entropy of the maximum disordered state. We claim that this is also the maximum value for the von Neumann entropy. What we are trying to do is to show that the entropy for the maximum disordered state is also the maximum entropy, while the minimum disordered state would minimize it. This would justify the von Neumann entropy as a measure of the disorder of rho. To show that the entropy in the blue box is really the maximum, we use the form of S where the probabilities are the eigenvalues of rho. To make things simple, we shall prove this for the case of d equals 2. The general proof will proceed along the same lines. See the description below for further details. For d equals 2, s is given by. Where we have imposed the constraint that the probability sum to 1 explicitly. Therefore, s is just a function of a single variable p. To find the maximum, we require the first derivative to be 0. The derivative of the first term is given by. 
For the second term, we simply have to replace p by 1 minus p, and note that there is a minus sign relating the derivative of p to 1 minus p, as shown in the white box. Requiring this to be zero implies So p must be equal to half. This gives the value for maximum entropy. And is consistent with the expression for general d. To confirm that this extremal value is really the maximum, we need to show that the second derivative is negative. Indeed it is. Thus there is a correspondence between the maximum of the von Neumann entropy and the maximum disordered state. All the eigenvalues of this state are equal to 1 over d, which is the uniform probability of getting any state. We now look for a state that minimizes S. Going into the eigenbases again. We realize that this is a sum of positive numbers and so must be non-negative. This suggests that the minimum entropy could be zero if only we could find a state with this entropy. This is easy as it is just a mixed state with only one non-zero probability, taking the value of 1 and the rest are zero, in other words, a pure state. To evaluate the left-hand side of this inequality given the probabilities in the white box, we need to calculate the following limit. This is easily shown to go to zero. If we rewrite the function like so, and use the L'Hopital's rule. The term associated with probability 1 is also 0. This is quite straightforward. Therefore, we have also confirmed a correspondence between the minimum entropy and a pure state. A pure state is a natural definition for a state of minimum disorder, as we are certain that the system is definitely in a particular state. Thus the von Neumann entropy is really a measure of disorder in rho. It tells us whether rho is a pure state or mixed state. We have come to the final part of this lecture. This is where we discuss issues on the foundations of quantum mechanics that are still arguably controversial and remain on the frontier of current research. Let's talk about the interpretations of quantum mechanics. This is how the formalism of QM is related to what we observed in the lab. That is, what actually happens when we make a measurement on a quantum system. This may come as a surprise to you that after a hundred years or so since the foundations of the quantum theory is laid, that we could still be asking this question. Isn't this the first question we would answer? Indeed, as soon as the formalism of quantum mechanics is fully developed in the 1930s, physicists have came up with the Copenhagen interpretation to relate abstract quantities like state vectors and operators to what is observed in experiments concerning quantum systems like the hydrogen atom. The agreement between the theory and experiments had been spectacular and has been so ever since. This is important because it means that the theoretical models we have built, including the measurement process of physical quantities, have been largely correct. But some questions remain about some of the assumptions made that are implicit in these applications of quantum mechanics. These have led to the development of alternative interpretations of the theory. For example, the many worlds interpretation which is quite popular these days. Decoherent histories promoted by eminent physicists like Murray Gell-Mann.
and the de Broglie boom theory or boomian mechanics, just to name a few. But for these, we shall postpone the discussion to future videos. Here we shall focus on the Copenhagen interpretation and the problems with it that stimulate the development of all these alternative theories. The Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics is developed under the leadership of the great Danish physicist Niels Bohr in the 1930s. It is the most direct interpretation of quantum mechanics that is in fact built into the postulates of the theory itself. Measurement and the unitary time evolution of a quantum system are treated as two incompatible processes. Let's review the postulates of quantum mechanics. Number 1. The states of quantum systems are described by vectors in a Hilbert space. Recall that a Hilbert space is where complex vectors live, in which a sesquilinear inner product of vectors is defined. These are just Dirac's brackets, or probability amplitudes. Number 2. Observables, which are physical quantities we can measure of quantum systems, are represented by Hermitian operators in Hilbert space. Number 3. The measured values of these observables are the eigenvalues of these operators. Number 4 is the Born rule. The German physicist Max Born came up with this. This gives the probability of getting a particular outcome as a result of a measurement. It is here that probability is introduced into quantum mechanics. Number 5 tells us the state of a quantum system right after we measure one of its observables, which is the eigenstate associated with the measured value. Number 6 tells us how a quantum system evolves in time, by unitary evolution. The last three postulates are where most questions about interpretations occur. Postulates 4 and 5 are precisely what define the Copenhagen interpretation. In fact, these are all it has to say about measurement. No further details are provided because it doesn't say anything new about the measurement process compared with classical physics. The key difference is that the outcomes of measurements are now fundamentally probabilistic and these probabilities are given by the Born rule. In contrast, the new quantum processes over time are described with precise details in the last postulate. So are the quantum kinematics established in the first three postulates which are radically different from those in classical physics. In other words, the Copenhagen interpretation says just use classical physics to describe your measuring apparatus. Of course, for most practical purposes, this works extremely well since these instruments are macroscopic objects and classical physics was developed precisely from observing such objects. As we shall see, a potential problem arises when we consider quantum mechanics to be a universal theory and apply it even to large objects. For now, let's examine the two kinds of state change that could occur in quantum mechanics. One is the deterministic unitary evolution of a state vector without any measurement taking place during the process. It takes a finite time for the system to change from an initial state to the final state. The process is deterministic, as the final state is fixed through the action of the time evolution operator on a given initial state. This is exactly the same situation as classical mechanics, as long as no measurements are made. To be more accurate, one could measure a very special type of observable of the system, which at any point in time would leave the system in the same state vector, as determined by unitary evolution. We would get psi t as the outcome with 100% probability. This is the case in which the observable we measure at a point in time has psi t as one of its eigenvector. Only with this restrictive choice of measurement, do we replicate the situation in classical mechanics, where the state of the system is left undisturbed during observation 
and we do not need postulates 4 and 5, as in quantum mechanics. However, for the measurement of all the other observables, for which psi t is not the eigenstate, we would encounter the second type of state change in quantum mechanics. Where the change from the initial state to the final state due to the measurement of an observable A is probabilistic according to the Born rule. In sharp contrast to unitary evolution, quantum mechanics does not prescribe any time evolution rule for this process. This leads naturally to the question, does this change occurs over a finite time, or is it instantaneous? Since quantum mechanics has no prescription for the time evolution of the measurement process, any suggestions will be an extension of the standard formalism. We are not prepared to do this here, it lies in the domain of current research. We leave it as a food for thought for our viewers. Within the formalism of quantum mechanics, we are left with the possibility that this state change is instantaneous. This is commonly referred to as the collapse of the wave function from the initial state to the measured outcome. Note that the state psi before measurement is certainly physically distinct from the outcome state An. So it is not unreasonable to conclude that a physical change has taken place instantaneously. Some would call this unphysical. This leads some to suggest that in fact no physical change has taken place. Rather, we have simply updated our description of the system upon receiving more information from the measurement. For this to make sense, it seems that one needs to assume that the physical change has already taken place through some underlying time-dependent process. And we are just recording the end result being ignorant of this process. This kind of argument seems to draw analogy from the situation in classical statistical mechanics, where probabilities arise as a result of the ignorance of the observer about the initial conditions of the system. Imagine the situation where we are sampling from an ensemble of particles in phase space. Suppose we find a particle among many in a small phase space volume around the point xp. The probability for us to find the particle there is proportional to the density of particles at that location. The higher the density, the higher the probability that we would find a particle there. This can be quantified by some density function f of xp. Therefore, f is like a wave function before measurement in classical statistical mechanics. It tells us how probable it is to find a particle at some location in phase space. f also satisfies some kind of dynamical equation which governs how it evolves in time. The exact details are not relevant here. The point is that the particle we have found at xp did not just appear there instantaneously, taking that value of position and momentum upon measurement. Rather, it arrived at where we have found it on a deterministic trajectory which can be traced back to a definite initial point. Hence in this case, we can view the change of state from f to xp as truly an update of information that is already present. The key is that probability here as quantified by f is not fundamental, but rather an approximation. Because we can't possibly follow the trajectories of 10 to the power of 23 particles in an experiment, the exact laws are the laws of classical mechanics governing each trajectory. Unfortunately, the situation is completely different for quantum mechanics. The system is not in the observed outcome before the measurement actually takes place. Such possibilities are ruled out by experiments which confirm the violation of the Bell's inequality by quantum systems. One such experiment by John Clauser, Alan Aspect, and Anton Zeilinger is awarded the 2022 Nobel Prize in Physics. 
It involves making measurements on pairs of entangled photons and examining the resulting core relations. This will be discussed in great details when we reach Chapter 12 of Weinberg's book. So the interpretation of state change due to measurement as just an update of information on the system is put into question. But even if we have to accept the instantaneous collapse of the wave function as a fact of nature, there seems to be no actual problem. Such events are everywhere in the quantum realm. Take the example of the emission of a photon by an electron as a transit from an excited state to the ground state within an atom. Initially, there is only the electron. In the next instant, a photon appears. This is instantaneous. This is very different from the classical case, where an electromagnetic wave is emitted continuously over time. Thus it seems that the instantaneous collapse of the wave function upon measurement must be accepted as a fact of nature, if probabilities are fundamental and have no underlying causes. But that's okay. A more serious problem arises if we consider quantum mechanics to be a universal theory. This means it has to apply to objects of all scales, not just particles. These include the measuring apparatus and even the observer. In general, everything else in the environment of the quantum system under observation must also be quantum. An argument for this view is that, since everything is made of atoms, and these are governed by quantum mechanics, so must be the composite systems of atoms. This is the reductionist view that underlies much of our modern understanding of the physical world. Let's look at a simple example to illustrate this view. The ideas involved are actually quite general and is again due to von Neumann. Suppose the quantum system we are observing is in a state psi and we wish to measure its observable A. To do this, we must place the system in contact with a measuring apparatus, which is now described by a quantum state phi zero. This indicates the initial setting of the apparatus before it takes any readings about the system. Note that this state can be quite complex and may consist of also the environment. It is anything that could receive information about the system through interactions. In fact, this may not even be a pure state, but is part of some statistical ensemble. However, this would not matter to our discussion, since one could take an ensemble average in the end. For simplicity, we have omit the tensor product symbol between the states. Phi is sometimes called the pointer state, as it is supposed to point to the measured value of the observable we are measuring. To measure A, we switched on the following interaction. This is the Hamiltonian that generates time evolution during the measurement process. P is the momentum operator of the pointer and so would generate the translation of the pointer position when readings are taken. H bar G is just the strength of the interaction and will determine the rate of measurement. Let's see what happens when the system and pointer interacts for a time delta t. Let the time evolution operator act on each element in the superposition. The operator A is acting on its eigenstates and can be replaced by its eigenvalues. The eigenstates A n are unaffected by this unitary transformation, but their eigenvalues now determine how much phi zero is being translated. We have assumed phi zero is a position state at the initial pointer position x zero. When this undergoes a translation, we get thus the pointer is translated by an amount that is proportional to the eigenvalues A n which we are measuring. 
We can make things simpler by setting the parameters according to the green box. In this way, the readings of observable A are registered on the pointer state of the measuring apparatus. Here's where we encounter a potential problem. When the measurement interaction has progressed to the stage where the pointer states have distinct readings. For now, let's assume that this is defined by the vanishing of inner products between distinct states. Unitary time evolution implies that the joint system of the observed and the measuring apparatus must form a coherent superposition of correlated states, as in the blue box. Because this is how states of isolated systems evolve in time according to quantum mechanics, now that the measuring apparatus is also described by a quantum state. But what we actually see in reality is not the superposition of states as in a blue box, but rather individual elements each associated with one eigenstate of A occurring with probabilities given by the Born rule. So what's going on? Note that if quantum mechanics is a universal theory, it should not forbid states like those in the blue box, even though it involves a macroscopic system in a superposition of distinct states. And because quantum mechanics doesn't really tell us which of these states to use and when, this forces us to invent a new rule for the quantum states of macroscopic systems in order to fit the empirical observations in the green box. The most straightforward one would be to forbid the superposition of distinct states of a macroscopic system. Thus, when a state like the one in the blue box occurs during unitary evolution, it would immediately collapse into one of the states in the green box with the probability prescribed by the Bond rule. As a rule of thumb, we may estimate a macroscopic system as one that contains roughly 10 to the power of 23 particles, which is the number of particles contained in human-scaled objects. This is an example of a superselection rule, which prevents the observation of the superpositions of certain states. However, this leads to more questions. A rule of thumb doesn't really qualify as a scientific principle. How many particles does it take exactly for such a superselection rule to kick in? And in what kinds of states should they be in? Standard quantum mechanics has no answers. In fact, when we look into the question of what kind of quantum states should describe a macroscopic system, we open up another can of worms. Recall that we have earlier defined two macroscopic quantum states as being distinct by the usual condition that distinct quantum states are orthogonal. But if the pointer states are truly quantum states, then we should be able to express them in a different basis. Assuming that this new basis is orthonormal, wouldn't a pointer state associated with a definite measurement outcome of an observable be itself a superposition of distinct states in this new basis? Hence, in order to make the whole measurement scheme work, we may have to abandon the superposition principle for states describing macroscopic systems. But this would just be equivalent to treating such systems as classical objects. And we are led right back to the original Copenhagen interpretation. The parable of the Schrodinger's cat illustrates perfectly the absurdity that will result from the application of the quantum superposition principle to macroscopic objects. We start with a radioactive nucleus which can be described by the following state, where the probability for the nucleus to remain in its undecayed state decays over time by the exponential law. Gamma is the decay rate, while T is the time since the nucleus was created. Let's bring this microscopic system together with a macroscopic object, namely a live cat. Let's assume that the cat can also be described by quantum mechanics. 
A detector is set up that will monitor the nucleus such that if it hasn't decayed, nothing will happen and the cat will remain alive. But if decay has occurred, it would trigger the release of some poison, thus killing the cat. Therefore, over time, the nucleus and the cat will be found in this joint state, which is an entangled state between nucleus and cat. The absurdity lies in the fact that the cat is now in a superposition between alive and dead. This is of course contrary to our experience, instead the Bond rule should be applied. We have come to the end of this video. Hopefully, all these questions concerning the measurement process will motivate you to read more about it. They are very much topics of current research. Experiments around the world are trying to produce the so-called Schrodinger's cat states to test the limit of quantum superposition. So far, they have had great successes in the production of superpositions of distinct states in mesoscopic systems. That is, systems that are between microscopic and macroscopic, roughly around tens of particles. There are also numerous studies on the effects of decoherence in quantum systems. In fact, many physicists consider decoherence theory as the explanation for the measurement process in quantum mechanics. See the description below for links to articles if you are interested in reading more about these topics. This concludes Chapter 3 of Weinberg's Lectures on Quantum Mechanics. In the next video, we shall move on to Chapter 2, where the quantum formalism developed in this video is applied to solve the problems of the hydrogen atom and the quantum harmonic oscillator. This should provide some hands-on experience for all the abstract concepts we have learned till now. If you find this video helpful, consider subscribing to this channel to get regular updates on new videos. Leave your questions in the comment section, and I will try to answer them in a follow-up video. See you next time, and thanks for watching.